So our, our next speaker is uh, Sai Srikar Kasi uh, from Princeton, a cost and power feasibility analysis of quantum annealing for next G cellular wireless networks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm Sigurd Kasi from Princeton, and uh, I, today I'm going to present our recent work, a cost and power feasibility analysis of quantum money link for next g cellular wireless networks. And this is a collaborative work with University College London and Interdigital. So in a wireless communication scenario, like a, there, there are like base stations which are serving the num uh, a number of users. And today the number of internet users has been increasing significantly. And according to like Cisco uh, industry reports, by 2023, about 66% of the population will be using internet. And to meet the resulting demand, uh, there are new robust technologies coming in, such as multiple input, multiple output communication, uh, robust channel coding schemes, and the use of millimeter wave communication. And the result of like these two things is basically the increasing power consumption at base stations. And this has two major problems, like one along the economic side, like due to increased operational expenditures, and another along the environmental side due to increased carbon emissions. So how to control this power consumption? So there are several traditional techniques, like one of them is sleep mode, to just to turn the base station on and off during low traffic times. And another approach is to optimize the radio transmission process itself. It says basically to use approximate algorithm instead of optimal algorithms, so you do less computation and take less power. But uh, these techniques like trade off trades of performance with like how much power they can save. So the most effective way is to improve the hardware components themselves. And traditionally, like CMOS hardware is being used at base stations and its performance per watt efficiency has been improving because of the Moore's law scaling. But uh, Moore's law scaling will eventually end and it is expected to terminate around uh, 2030. So this raises the question like whether CMOS hardware can achieve like next change cellular spectral energy efficiency targets. While this may well hold true, like there are, the, recently there is much interest in the community to explore alternative approaches to CMOS, and one such approach we explore is uh, quantum computing. So the first question that arises is like, why quantum computing for wireless networks? So in wireless networks, there are like very strict timing deadlines. By, by that I mean like first, if we look at like uh, how base station allocates bandwidth, so time and frequency are divided into several time frequency slots, and each subframe is about one millisecond right now in 5G. And these slots will be allocated to different users. And over time, the load varies at base station. So by strict timing deadlines, like uh, when we move from 5G to 6G or 7G, this uh, subframe, subframe decoding time is decreasing and decreasing while the load is increasing. And uh, to decode signals, uh, the optimal algorithms are like computationally very heavy and which results in higher power consumption. So with quantum computing, like, uh, Recent work has shown like indeed like wireless problems can be converted into Ising models like and the work has also shown like the real results from real quantum annealing machines. And quantum machines also have like low power consumption and with engineering advances like we might get like a substantial speed ups over conventional computing. So this is our uh, overall envision scenario. Uh, we envision uh, quantum processing units at centralized RAN baseband units where uh, a processing from like a number of base stations is being aggregated. Quantum computing will take care of heavyweight, uh, heavyweight baseband processing tasks and uh, classical computation will take care of lightweight tasks. And in this kind of system, uh, what we are essentially doing is uh, we are investing in capital expenditure by purchasing quantum hardware of high cost. But we are reducing the operational expenditure because of low power consumption of quantum hardware and there is no need for additional cooling as well. So the total cost of ownership, which is like a CapEx plus OPEX, uh, there is a trade-off because like we are increasing CapEx and decreasing OPEX. So we need, we, so in this work, like we are going to find out like systems for which like the total cost of ownership decreases or over time, the total cost of ownership decreases. So let me summarize like uh, our, some, some of the key questions and answers in this kind of scenarios and uh, from the perspective of quantum annealing devices. So the first, first question is that like, how many qubits do we need for entire 5G processing? And for a small base station, we will need about like 40,000 qubits. Uh, by small base station, I mean like 10 megahertz bandwidth and 32 antenna base station. And for a macro base station, we need about 3 million qubits, uh, which is about uh, 200 megahertz bandwidth and 128 antenna base station. And the connectivity between these qubits is like highly sparse, meaning that like there, while there are like several problems in wireless networks, like 
most of the connect, uh, most of their Ising models are like highly sparse connectivities. And we can also imagine, because like we are solving problems related to like different, different users. So we can also envision like, uh, so we don't need like all these 3 million qubits to be entirely connected. So they, they can also be independent, multiple independent chips because we are solving problems related to different users. Uh, if we have this much number of qubits in the machine, how much power or cost uh, can quantum money link save over CMOS? So again, like for a small base station, we will not get any benefit because the computation is like not huge enough for uh, CMOS to blow up. And in macro base station scenario, like we can get about uh, 41 kilowatt power, which is 45% lower than CMOS. And at what year, like these, uh, the cube, this, these systems will become feasible based on like recent priorities in the industry. Like uh, we can get 40,000 qubits by 2026 in the best case scenario. And for for 3 million qubit machine, like uh, we might need to go wait until 15 years in the best case scenario. So how do we compute these values? Like uh, I'll explain it in a bit. So our evaluation methodology is like to consider like two key figures of merit in wireless systems. Like the first is spectral efficiency, which is like the number of bits processed per second per heads of frequency spectrum. And spectral efficiency is affected by latency and also the number of qubits we have. Another figure of merit is the energy efficiency, which uh, depends on the power consumption and also the number of qubits. And the interplay between these three values, like the latency, qubit count, and power consumption of QA hardware will determine whether QA can benefit from CMOS or not. So our goal in this work is to like project like uh, target values for these properties uh, so that like we can get benefit over CMOS. And we evaluate like CMOS versus QA at equal spectral efficiency targets. So let's analyze like uh, each of these three components one by one. So we have an input problem, which is, uh, which, uh, which is basically an Ising problem corresponding to a baseband unit task. And when we send an input problem to a quantum processing unit, like first the quantum processing unit will program the problem and set up for, uh, uh, set up for annealing. And next we will anneal the problem. And uh, once annealing is finished, we will read out the solution. And there is also a readout delay which to prepare the qubits for like, you know, next samples annealing. So this annealed readout cycle corresponds to one sample and we conduct multiple samples uh, for the problem. And overall sampling, uh, the time it takes for sampling is called sampling time. And uh, solutions corresponding to like multiple samples are also post-processed at once in batches. And this post-processing parallelizes with an annealer computation. So it does not factor into the overall processing time. And this last batch of post-processing parallels with next, uh, next problems programming. So once the post-processing is finished, we will collect the solutions. And what happens in this programming? So in programming, like we have like three components, like one is the coefficient setting and the programming thermalization and cubic reset. So here on the left-hand side, like we have uh, the left figure corresponds to like the physical hardware and uh, on the right figure we, uh, corresponds to graphical hardware of a chimera graph. And these long circular loops of wires are called are qubits, like these L-shaped structures or couplers and these small cylindrical structures are flux stacks. So when we send a problem to QA QPU, uh, the room temperature electronics will program these flux stacks uh, about the coefficient values and these flux stacks will program then onto qubits and couplers. And this process currently takes about like four to 40 microseconds. And if we want to maintain the same time uh, on like, you know, larger devices, we need to have like more control and bandwidth and for, for a 10 million qubit device, like we need to have control and bandwidth of about uh, tens of gigahertz. And once we program this uh, coefficients, like some amount of heat is dissipated in the QPU, and so we need to thermalize the system now. And based on like the number of uh, flux stacks uh, which are programming these QPUs uh, and, and what is the critical current, like uh, based on these values, we can actually compute like how much energy is dissipated on chip. And in the worst case scenario, like when all the qubits and all the couplers are uh, programmed and, and all the values are uh, changed from like with, with a five bit precision, like moving SFQs from minus 16 to plus 16, it turns out that like in a 10 million qubit device with like 15 couplers per qubit, about 36 picojoules of uh, heat will be dissipated. And in a QA refrigeration unit at the 15 millikelvin stage, we have about 30 microwatt of power. So in an ideal scenario, like uh, how much time we need to cool uh, this much amount of energy is basically like uh, energy divided by power. So it turns out to be about 1.2 microseconds. 
And next, like we will initialize the qubits. By initialization, I mean like to start the annealing algorithm in an equal superposition state or like an, in an intended ground state of an initial Hamiltonian. And when we initialize qubits, like qubits transition from a higher energy state to an intended ground state. And this process like emits uh, photons and also like uh, it corresponds to like uh, heat release, it's called partial loss. And using partial filters will reduce this loss and it, it takes about like 0.8 microseconds with, uh, to reset qubits with 99% confidence. So overall programming time is some of these times and it, we, we expect it to be 42 microseconds for large scale devices. And once we program, we need to anneal. Uh, currently, the minimum annealing time is about one microseconds, and which is dictated by control line bandwidth. There are also works uh, which talk about like, which talk about high control line bandwidth uh, using the use of flex print cables, which can reduce annealing time to about like uh, tens of nanoseconds. And in readout architecture, like uh, the readout information is basically the persistent current direction in qubits uh, at the end of annealing process, and readout takes place uh, along these flux bias lines. We have qubits and there are like several electrical circuits called like quantum flux parametrons, which uh, resonate the uh, current direction in qubits and propagate them from qubit to detectors, which are located at the perimeter of the QPO chip. And currently the readout uh, is time division, meaning that like one qubit per line is read at a time, and it takes about 25 to 150 microseconds per sample. And there are also like frequency multiplex readout schemes, like which can uh, parallelly read out like several qubits at a time, and we expect that uh, with frequency multiplex, like this time can maybe reduce to like uh, one microseconds per sample. And the read in readout delay, like we reset the qubits again and uh, we consider it to be one microsecond per sample. So the overall time uh, for NS sample we consider is uh, 42 plus three NS microseconds, where uh, the 42 corresponds to programming time and this three comes from like one for each, each of these annealed readout cycles. So next, let's see like how we compute this, uh, how, much, how much amount of qubits we need. So we have a cellular baseband unit in wireless systems and the cellular baseband unit uh, pro uh, like performs a number of like baseband processing tasks uh, out of which like I show here, like some of the heavy computational tasks such as frequency domain detection or forward error correction, filtering and equalization. So I'll explain like uh, one particular example about like how we estimate qubits. So given a 5G scenario, like uh, an example is shown here with like 200 megahertz band, 128 antennas and so on. So given a base station scenario, like uh, we, we, we have a target amount of computation in the worst case, when, meaning that like when the base station is full in 100 per, uh, time and frequency duty cycles. So, so in this scenario, like uh, for forward error correction, we have a target of about like 89.6 tera operations per second. And we convert this uh, operations per second to problems per second by using the number of operations per problem we need. For example, in 5G for forward error correction, LDPC codes are used. And for the longest LDPC code in 5G, it requires about like 150 million operations to decode one such problem. So using these two values, we can uh, compute like how many problems per second we need to solve at the base station. And with in, uh, in the Ising model formulation, like uh, from our previous work, basically, uh, we compute the number of qubits required per problem. Uh, and we also consider this 42 plus 3 NS microseconds overall problem processing time we discussed before. So using these values, we, uh, the entire qubit requirement to satisfy this 5G forward error correction demand becomes the number of problems per second times the number of qubits per problem times the runtime per problem. The runtime per problem here like uh, corresponds to like one or two microseconds, like which, which is uh, basically like taking taking 20 samples. So uh, if we want to take like more and more samples, like uh, as, you look in, uh, as you can observe here, like we will need more and more qubits. And it turns out like uh, with 20 samples, like we will need about 1.3 million qubits for FEC. So we repeat this computation for all of these baseband processing tasks and sum all the qubits we need. So the total qubit requirement for 5G turns out to be like, uh, on the X axis, like we have bandwidth and on the Y axis, we have a uh, qubit requirement. And for a 32 antenna system, uh, even at all, all of the bandwidths, like, you know, the total number of qubit requirement is less than a million. And when we go to like 64 antenna systems, like uh, the requirement it becomes like slightly higher than a million. And when we go to like larger and larger systems, we will need more and more qubits. So the takeaway point from this slide is basically like, uh, even for large system, like 256 antenna, 20, 200 megahertz bandwidth system, the total qubit requirement is less than 10 million. So let's see like how we do 
actual like power comparison analysis. So for quantum annealing hardware, the power consumption is currently 25 kilowatt, which is dominated by refrigeration unit. And it is not expected to scale uh, significantly for larger devices. But the problem becomes like, uh, if we have, we have like certain amount of qubit requirement for 5G, and if we want to maintain the same power, all of these qubits must fall under the same refrigeration unit. So this raises the question, how many qubits can we actually fit in a uh, refrigeration unit? So to answer this question, like we consider the physical size of qubits. A, uh, a tile of eight qubits takes about like 335 cross 385 micrometer squared qubit chip area. And in, in, the, in a dilution refrigerator, we have an experimental space of about 250 millimeter radius. So now this turns into a problem of like classic uh, dice per wafer or how many squares we can fit in a circle. And it turns out like about, we can fit about uh, 1.75 million uh, dice. And each die has like uh, eight qubits. So it turns out to be like, we can fit about 40 million qubits in a single refrigeration unit. And since 5G qubit count estimates are like uh, significantly lower than 40 million. So QA power consumption we consider is 25 kilowatt. So uh, we compute like CMOS hardware power based on the uh, amount of computation and the performance per watt efficiency of CMOS. And we do evaluation for like uh, two types of CMOS, which is current CMOS, 40 nanometer CMOS is a current device. It has about like uh, 0.076 teraoprens per second per watt efficiency. And we, we also do compare uh, against 1.5 nanometer CMOS, which is expected to be the CMOS technology at the end of Moore's law scaling. And it has about like 0.3 uh, teraoprens per second per watt efficiency. We, we also account for leakage power in CMOS. and uh, It is set to about 30% of the dynamic power. And if you look at results like, uh, on the x-axis, we have bandwidth. On the y-axis, like we have a uh, power power uh, of CMOS, uh, 1.5 nanometer CMOS. The horizontal line corresponds to like uh, the QA power consumption of 25 kilowatt. So, if if we have like a smaller system with like 32 antennas, like we will not get any uh, benefit uh, over 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 CMOS because uh, CMOS power is like already much lesser than QA. Even for 64 antenna systems, we don't get any benefit, but when we go to larger and larger systems, we start getting benefits. So when we go to a system of like uh, 128 antennas, we have benefited uh, 180 megahertz bandwidth and 128 antenna systems. And when, when, we, when we go to like more larger systems, we get benefits over a wide range of uh, bandwidths. So the left-hand side plot has shown like, this is the, just the baseband power. If you look at the entire seat and power. So in this scenario, like, the left bars show like power consumption when CMOS is at the at a seed and at a baseband unit, and the right bars show that when QA is at a baseband unit. So you can see like when QA uh, with QA like there is like a power reduction in baseband unit, and in R in remote radio heads like there is no absolute power reduction, but like you know the percentages uh, are different because the total power is different. In front hall in front hall also we don't have any power reduction because like. Uh, QA is not solving these problems. In power system, we do have a reduction because like we don't need additional cooling. And if you look at like the entire serial power consumption, we have like several uh, several hundred, uh, about like 150 kilowatt power reduction when we have QA base station. So we put all these things together in a feasibility timeline. So on the x-axis we have year, on the y-axis we have qubit count. So the data points in this hashed area are the historical qubit counts and after 2020, the extrapolations are basically the extrapolations of best case and the worst case qubit growth respectively. So the, the best case qubit growth trend is from like 2070 to 2020 and the worst case is from 2020 to 2023 projected. So if the QA qubit count scale uh, scales along this best case trend uh, by 2026, we might solve like a small system. Uh, this system basically corresponds to uh, the number of qubits required over here on the X axis, on the Y axis. So as we go ahead, like by 2030, we can solve like a larger system and we can solve more larger systems as we move forward. But uh, so even if we solve like a small systems, like we saw before, like we don't get any benefit in small systems. Uh, so if we want to get a power advantage, we need to solve a large enough system and it is projected to be like, uh, like about 15 years away in the best case, if the QA qubit count scales along the best case. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll take any questions now. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, we have one question in the chat. Um, if you'd like to take a look at the chat and uh, read out the question and reply to it. 
uh, if you expect you need three million qubits, then hybrid and suggested by the way. Yeah, actually like uh, not in this work, but like in a different work, we do consider like hybrid approaches, basically because like, if you look at like current near term machines, like to get like a larger machine, like it will take a lot of time. So we also need to consider like hybrid approaches. We do consider them. So this analysis is like is uh, not based on Chimera or Jeffrey graph. So basically we have like some set of problems in uh, wireless networks and we assume like, you know, the future QA hardware will be, uh, will be exactly as that of the connectivity of Ising. So it's like a custom hardware and it is not like a bad assumption basically because like the connectivity is very sparse. Like if you look at like LEPC codes, for example, like uh, more than 80% of qubits will have uh, about less, less than 15 couplers per qubit and about less than 2% uh, of 1% will have uh, more than 30 couplers. Okay, are there any other questions? If not, uh, let's thank our speaker again.